So I'm Dr. Lin. I'm the director of the UC Irvine Epilepsy um, Program. And uh, um, I've been in Orange County and Irvine and this area for the past 15 years. Um, so um, I've been here quite a long time and I've seen taking care of a lot of patients. I also do very active research in memory and learning. I, um, I've also been extensively publishing in understanding the different aspects of epilepsy, not just the seizures, but depression and anxiety and all the other things that comes with epilepsy. So, um, but I also do lots of surgeries. So pretty much whatever you want to ask. I mean, this is sort of an information session. So um, hopefully you brought questions. Um, you know, otherwise you don't want to hear me to blab on for the next 30 minutes um, continuously. So questions about a doubt with epilepsy or anything about epilepsy or just life in general <laughs> or the Halloween you what do you dress as a giant chicken you did no. oh <laughs> my wife dresses as giant chicken yeah. pictures to show for them. I heard you. <laughs> why is the medication so expensive why is medication so expensive that's a real good question <clears throat> the reason is because um, there are a couple of reasons. One is the fact that it takes them a lot of money to develop the medicine and bring it to the market. And if the, the, they have to go through different trials. They first have to make sure that it works in animal and safe. Then they have to do a second phase where they have to, the preclinical, then they have to look at and make sure it's safe, but it doesn't even have to show effectiveness. And third part is showing that it is effective. And so that takes a long time, and then they get a patent for X number of years. And I'm not a patent lawyer, so I don't know exactly when where they have exclusive right. That's when they can price the, the drug pretty much what they want to price as. Now, what is a misnomer out there is that new drugs are ne not necessarily better than old drugs. That's what the drug company wants you to believe. That's all the people who are sponsoring this want you to believe. But there's never been a study showing that new drug is more efficacious than old drug. Oh, we have somebody from there. He, he doesn't like me saying that. <laughs> um, but that's the truth. Um, what the new drug does offer are usually less side effects, usually does not interact with other medication that one may be on for like blood thinning or other things, and you don't have to check blood levels. So those are really nice conveniences that if you could have it, why not having it, right? So that's sort of the, the answer as to why drugs are so expensive. They also do lots of marketing and, and other costs that they, they have, but they really put in, they sort of made the bet. And if they made, you know, in, 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 in a um, capitalist country like what we have, which is what we should have, if they made the bet and they won the bet, they should have to keep the earning on. That's simple as that. But they also hedge the bet because if you look at the, the drugs, often the drugs sh have similar mechanism as previous drug, but just an improved version of it. What that does is that they, they hedge the bet so that you don't get some crazy side effect that after the marketing that all of a sudden come up and then you have to withdraw the drug. Now you just waste it literally billions of dollars on the development of the drug that can't get to the market because no one uses it. So, you know, so there's a lot of, of, of those things going on. But many years ago, you know, several decades ago, um, there was a seminal study by um, Patrick Kwan and, and, and uh, um, Martin Brody um, to look at um, how many drugs you need to fail in order to become drug resistant in order to say that you have drug resistant epilepsy. And at that time, most of the drugs were old drugs, right? And it turned out that the number was three. Okay, after you fell three drugs, and it doesn't matter, at the time, you know, lamotrigine was a new drug, topiramine was considered a new drug, and of course there were the dilantin, the depakote, and, and, and those drugs. But, Yep, and you, I'm sure you all have a, but 
what happened was that um, so so that was then then this guy um, Patrick Kwan uh, uh, who was from at that time from Hong Kong and did a a a a, a, a this research a couple of years with with Martin Brody in Glasgow and then he went on and he became a professor in Hong Kong now he's in Melbourne they re, they did the study they looked at the study again now 20 years later or so and look at all the new drugs and the old drugs now you know you can see that the 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 chart the dilantin number is going down you know the, the, all the new drugs like you know it's going up but guess what how many drugs does it take for you to become to say that you the drugs don't work even with a new drug the number is still three and the number almost is exactly 20 years later. And that was published in JAMA Neurology, and the first study was published in New England Journal of Medicine. So these are the hard facts. Now, we do want, you know, one of the things, so, so, so what I'm saying is that it's nice to have drugs have less side effects. There's absolutely no question about it, if you can afford it. But if you can't afford it, it doesn't mean that you, can't go th you have to go through life and have uncontrollable seizures. There's still a lot of old, good old drugs that is still available to you that you should try. Now, if drug doesn't work, then you've got to look at surgery as an option because really that's the only way to cure people with epilepsy. And, and it's, surgery is so underutilized. Uh, um, surgery is the only thing that has no pharma influence. <laughs> you know. Most new drugs actually are approved by, by um, Medicare and Medicaid. It just requires the office to submit something called pre-authorization. Now, you know, we're academic centers, so we, do, we take it, mo a lot of underinsured people. Um, but, you know, but a lot of private docs don't want to do the paperwork because that's one less patient they see. That's one less patient for their bottom dollar, bottom line. Other questions? Yeah, so if somebody has, um, and I've heard this lately, is just, oh, I've had my very first seizure. Um, at what point, from a neurologist standpoint, do you say that was a fluke? Or at what point do you say this is a condition you now have? And, uh, and when do you start medication on that person because of all the side effects that the medication has? Wow, that is like a, 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 a doctor level, like a doctor to a doctor level question, which is great. Um, so let's look at some. Um, so it, it depends, and it's not a lot of depending. I'm not trying to be like, um, so one is that, so let's say the perfect scenario, somebody who, um, and I just, uh, you know, my, my, my um, niece just had her, a seizure like this past week and she's only two and a half years old so a lot of times you look at it and you say is there something that caused that seizure if there's a clear inciting factor you know somebody who's dehydrated who is um, uh, um, who has some sort of infection and you treat the underlying cause then that seizure should usually go away and that you don't have epilepsy so one is clearly a something provoked it. So she had an MRI, so she had a CT scan, she had a bunch of blood work and turned out that it found out that she had hand, foot, mouth disease and you know that caused a fever and fever led to the seizure. So clearly it was a reason for it. But um, so but if how about if somebody come in an adult with um, first seizure, clearly convulsive, no question about it, wasn't syncope or anything, MRI is normal, EEG is normal, um, then, when you look at it, um, the the the, um, the numbers are um, seventy percent chance that you'll never have another seizure ever in your lifetime. That was just one seizure, because the chance of anyone having one seizure in their lifetime is ten, uh, you know, one in ten. So you know, we have ten people in this room, right? You know, so. One nine, that got left. Um, but um, 
then that means that one of us will have a <coughs> seizure, but doesn't mean that that person has epilepsy. Now, if the seizure should occur at night, then you are at higher risk for having reoccurrence, slightly higher risk. So there are little, few little, if the MRI is abnormal, now that number is completely different. So, the, so people will say that if you have an abnormal MRI, uh, and this is according to a British study from the UK, um, so these are all like hard facts, not something I pull out of my head. Um, um, so, um, so no abnormal, something on the MRI like a brain trauma or some sort of, you know, abnormality or developmental, um, abnormal EEG and for one seizure, you probably should start medication because chances of you having another seizure is extremely high. But if you just have one seizure and everything else is normal, the chances are so uh, relatively low that if I start people on seizure medication, then I will over-treat 70% of the people. People didn't tell you that, huh? Now, let's cut, think about this thing a little bit. Um, so, how about I said, Doc, but you know what? I want some insurance, right? Well, you know, I, yeah, you said that these are, but there's still a 30% chance, and you know, why not put me on a medication so that you know, I can go back drive and I will um, not have another seat. You know, I will prevent that 30%. Well, let's just think about that logic a little bit. Um, and uh, it's funny because this is the exact lesson that, that Pete Engel taught me 20, 15, 18 years ago. He's my mentor. Um, he's probably the father of epilepsy. He's going he's gonna to be on the panel with me in the next 30 minutes or so. So he's 80 years old. Um, but, but he just, so I, that was the argument I gave him, you know, 17 or 18 years ago. And uh, he said, well, let's just think about this. Jack, how long are you going to treat this person who had one seizure and everything normal on the drug? I said, one year. Why one year? I don't know. Two years? Okay, two years. So then what do you do? Oh, I'm going to slowly stop the seizure. Uh, the medication. Then he said, well, if you still slowly stop the medication, what are the chances now after two years that person will have another seizure? The number is still the same. The ones are going to seize are going to gonna seize. It's 30% and 70%. The number hasn't changed. You just delay the process for two years. And now that person will go on and have uh, um, you know, have to, if you have another seizure, we'll have to suspend the license again and go through the whole process again. So it's better for the brain, as cruel as it may sound, to declare itself and say, do I have epilepsy, because you all have a tendency to have a seizure on a second time that's unprovoked, then for sure. Because if you have two seizures, then the chances of, 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 um, of, uh, um, of um, um, having another third and fourth seizures, the numbers flip now, it's 70-30. So does that make sense? Um, so it's really, you have to really think very critically, not just, you know, number one is, excuse me, but I cover my ass kind of a doctor, you know, I don't want to get sued, so, you know, I'm going to put you on medication because then I did the right thing and, you know, but if you really think about these numbers, hard numbers, you realize that's not the right thing to do. That's a very long-winded answer, but it's a complicated question. <coughs> anyone, anyone in the back have any questions? No? Okay. I don't want to. Do you have any questions? Do you have a go? Okay. Then you go, you go again. <laughs> <laughs>
Seizures can outgrow, and if the, if, um, if the seizures are controlled with two medications, it's been a while. Um, after, so, so that was the stigma of epilepsy is is one question I think you have. Um, yeah, that's a it's an unfair stigma we do to people, but we do it regularly. Right, day. right. But then, um, so the 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 International League Against Epilepsy, which is an international body of doctors um, um, led by Dr. Robert Fisher. I think he's, I don't know if he's here. Yeah, he is here this afternoon. Um, made a consensus statement that if somebody has had been off of medication and have been seizure free for, I believe, 10 years, um, they are no longer called epileptic. So somebody who's controlled, don't, you don't have to live with the label for the rest of your life you know, whether you have surgery or other means of controlling the seizure, if you've been seizure-free and off of medication for an extended amount of time, then then you don't have to carry that label. Um, in terms of the, the, the brain bleed, um, you know, people won't, there won't be any surgical intervention if the medication controls it. Because and you, it's a, the only way to get rid of an area that's been damaged by bleed is with surgery, brain surgery. And the risk of brain surgery outweighs the um, benefit if the medication can control your seizures. Um, yeah. yeah. But you still can try to find the medication that causes the least amount of side effects and most tolerable to so the, the, if, if you think about medication-wise, it's very important to think about um, side effects of m medication. So they've done, this is many years ago, this guy named Frank Gilliam done this study where they look at quality of life on one axis and, um, and side effects on one the other. And there's a direct correlation between poor quality of life and greater number of side effects. And if when, so this is often something that when you go to a doctor's office, they don't ask you. You know, they ask you, well, how's your seizure? Seizure's doing great. Okay, good. See you next six months or whatever, you know. But <clears throat> if the side effects, uh, um, but, so, but then when the, in this study, when they actively ask patients about side effects and change medication to reduce the side effect, the quality of life goes up. The other thing that was surprising is that quality of life did not have any direct correlation with the number of seizures, as long as somebody is having seizures. Because if you, there's unpredictability of when the next seizure could be, so whether you're having one seizure a week or one seizure a month, which is, you know, if you look at a drug study with one seizure a month versus one seizure a week, that's, you know, 75% reduction in seizures over a month. But Realistically, you still don't know that one seizure a month when they're, they're going to come. And that still gets that worry, the stigma, and all of that stuff. So, so while the doctors are so focusing on getting the seizure, and rightly so, getting the seizure down from, you know, the number down, they often don't consider the side effects on medication. Um, the truth of the answer is we probably don't know. Um, it doesn't seem to be, um, you know, have long-term effects on people have been on medication for years and, you know, they don't get 
you know, liver damage where they need a, a transplant or kidney damage where they'd be on dialysis. I mean, those things don't happen. But, you know, it's just impossible to tell, you know, whether there's certainly there are certain medications that have more cognitive side effects than others. And long term, you know, people may have worse memories and performances than others. But, it's, you know, we don't know. Well, the side effects on these nine compliance are usually uh, sedation and cognitive slowing um, because they just don't like the way they feel. So some of my patients, and this is especially in people who are high performers, um, students, college students, I have several of them, where they won't take the, take the medication the morning of, of the test so that they can perform reasonably well on the test and then they take it later. The trouble is that then the level goes down, they may have a seizure in classroom. So, um, but you know, that's just anecdotal. Um, I, I, I don't know whether, you know, I don't know the real answer to that. <coughs> I'm not sure there's a study saying what would be the, I'm sure there is a study. Just don't, yeah. So, because of the side effects of the medications, and I know that um, over the years, there's, which I've learned, is that there are specific medications for depending on the type of seizure right. that you have. Right, right. Um, so, two questions. The first one is, when they're creating a drug, so for Neurotin, Neurotin used to be an approved epileptic drug right. back in the day. Right. Then, as studies happened, it was determined that it wasn't one of the better epileptic drugs and that it was better for depression or something like that. So when they're creating the drug, how do they determine necessarily what what seizure type is that going to to be best used for? And then the second thing is because of the side effects with the medication, at what point with the new uh, electronic, like the VNS, the RNS, and the DVS, at what point will doctors push those as a primary source of treatment versus the medication as a first alternative? Um, so, how do they decide whether the medicine is good for generalized seizures? You know, basically, there are two types of seizures. They're either generalized, where the seizures come everywhere in the brain, or at once. Um, the prototypic generalized seizures is childhood absence epilepsy, or juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and the set of medication for that, versus focal seizures, which is come from one area of the brain. And uh, um, they have models, rat models, that recapitulate generalized seizures versus focal seizures. That will be, you know, and then subsequently they have to test it in, in, in humans. But, um, so yeah, so, in, in, so that's kind of how they decide um, a lot of the, uh, the seizure medications are approved for focal and then later become, you know, tested in generalized epilepsy and shown to be effective. And sometimes it's by serendipity. Anyone here ever heard of something called Depakote? Yeah? Have you guys heard of Depakote or <coughs> Valproic Acid? I think I maxed out on that one, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. Well, Depakote is a pretty common drug for, uh, older drug for um, epilepsy. Um, it's for generalized epilepsy. And uh, the story goes that they were testing this compound. And, uh, you know, you, there was compound A, B, and C. And, uh, you know, one of the models, maximum electric shock. You shock the rat tail and sees, and they found how much electricity does take to shock the little rat. Uh, uh, and uh, if it takes more electricity to shock the rat, then the drug shows some sort of protection, right? And so they gave the rat compound A. Worked! Wow, lucky day today. Compound B, worked again. Whoa, real lucky day today. And then they dump on compound C, 
work just like AB. What's going on? All three drugs that I've screened all worked. What do you think is the reason why all three drugs worked? It's a solvent that would dissolve the drug in. That was the common between A, B, and C. And the solvent became depocoat. In a sense. So sometimes it's by serendipity. The black swan. Any other questions? If not, we don't <coughs> have to sit here for, you know, you can, we can go and walk around and, yeah. you know. Okay, if there are no more questions, then thank you.